Hey, welcome to part two of this video in which we're going to be taking this high resolution sculpt we did last time. It's got about 1.3 million faces and we're going to be retopologizing it and UV unwrapping it and applying textures, baking some normal maps and integrating it into my main model of Hogwarts castle. So let's get started here. Uh, first thing I was going to do was set up an object for retopology. Um, retopology is all about tracing over the, the high resolution sculpt with a much, much simpler object that's going to still hold the same basic form but not eat up so much of the computer's resources. Uh, as I said, the original sculpt here is about 1.3 million faces, or polygons, and uh, the ultimate face count, I believe, for the retopologized version came out to about 1,500 vertices, or uh, 1,500 faces, rather, uh, which is <laughs> quite a reduction by, by almost a thousandfold, and so that makes it a lot easier for the computer to handle this. Uh, retopology, and really topology in general, is not something I have an easy time with. So if you're an expert in these things, you'll probably see me do some pretty questionable things in here. Um, I'm trying to trying to handle this reasonably well, mainly as uh, as practice, as an exercise. Even though I know that I'm not going to be uh, applying a subdivision modifier to it, I'm not going to be animating it, and so. Some of the sort of rules of, of topology for 3D modeling uh, are going to be less important here because it's just going to be a, a static stationary asset within a much larger model. Uh, but I still tried to follow some of the, the rules that you, you hear about. You want to try to stick mainly to quads, um, so that's four-sided faces. Um, not do too much in the way of triangles, and especially not n-gons, which are uh, faces that have more than four points, more than four vertices, because those tend to behave strangely when they're uh, automatically subdivided by the computer uh, to create a, a smoother, more complex surface. Uh, but again, as I said, I, I knew I wasn't going to be applying any subdivision to this version, um, so I didn't have to worry about that quite as much. Uh, also, when you're going to be animating an asset, uh, it becomes really important that you have enough detail on the right areas and that you don't have any areas that are going to pinch or deform strangely as as the object changes its shape as it as it animates. But again, I wasn't going to have to worry about that here. So I tried to approach things reasonably well, um, but there's definitely some spots where I made compromises. This is elapsing at an even faster rate than the part one of this video, I think I went with about 1200% speed, so it's going very quickly. Uh, and this isn't really intended as a tutorial. Um, there are much better resources out there for learning about retopology or topology in general. Uh, and I, those are the ones that I've, I've learned from too. So I, I won't try to, won't try to redo their masterful instruction on this, but I just wanted to give a little little insight uh, into how this part of the project works. It's definitely a very different workflow than uh, creating something like the central tower like we did in uh, an earlier video. And uh, sounds like uh, some people are enjoying this, so I thought I'd thought I'd continue with it. Here I'm working my way down to the hands a little bit. Hands are very tricky in topology because you're trying to control... Uh, or again, tricky for me. There's so many people who are able to just do this stuff and have it turn out beautifully and it's just kind of, I just do it, and it's easy for them, and, and that blows my mind. Uh, and if any of you have any <laughs> tips on that, I'd greatly appreciate it. Uh, but for me, uh, hands are, are difficult because you've got a lot of uh, levels of detail to try to control as you get into things like fingers, but then you don't want to have that same degree of detail as you move up the hands and up the arms. So a lot of spots where you're trying to control the, the flow of the, the face loops. One thing I was trying to be really intentional about with this Topo project was avoiding spirals in my face loops where um, that did occur in a number of spots in some of the other things I've, I've sculpted for this Hogwarts project, like the, the eagle statue that I did uh, for the clock tower courtyard, uh, as well as 
Oh shoot, what was the other one? Oh yeah, for, also for the clock tower courtyard, there were those gargoyles that stick out the sides of the walls. And those definitely had some some spiraling edge flows, which are not a good practice at all. And I think in this one, I was completely successful in avoiding spirals, at least. I did cheat and intentionally put in a few triangles here and there uh, where I knew I could get away with it for this particular <laughs> setup. But, uh, but I don't believe there are any spirals, so I was really proud of myself for that. <laughs> here we're working on the, the nostril, trying to give enough detail to where it'll still hold up in terms of silhouette. Uh, and also the normal map that I'll bake later, which is a way of faking all the details. And it won't have to do too much heavy lifting. It'll truly just get to fake the details and not anything about the actual large scale shape. Working my way down the cheeks and into the jawline. Uh, one way I think a, a lot of artists will work is they'll try to set up all the major face loops first and you saw earlier in the video I did some of that, but then I started connecting stuff up. So I, I do bounce around a fair amount here as I work on, on these fringes. I try to get some topology going for that, and then I end up trying to connect it all back up and bounce back and forth quite a bit. As I believe I mentioned in the first part of this video, I'm not taking an insanely detailed rigorous approach with this because I know it's going to be, again, one small part of a project, uh, and you're not going to be seeing this up close really after <laughs> this video and the corresponding blog post. Uh, I just want it to, to read well from a distance and be able to get the camera in decently close uh, if I ever want to for, for renders of the greenhouses. You'll see me occasionally uh, with yellow lines popping up along the, the geometry I've already created. Uh, those are spots where I've hit Control r in Blender to, to take a look at some, some edge cuts, uh, uh, edge loop cuts, to see if my flow of, of edges and faces is, is working the way I want it to. I, I'm not particularly good at visualizing what they're doing unless I, I use that to check. So you even saw some of that just there where I was checking to see, oh, do I have any spirals? Do I have any spots where the, the face loops are intersecting themselves or behaving in strange ways? For the most part, I think I did okay. Another thing I didn't pay that much attention to is the density. There are some areas here where the geometry zigzags a little more than it needs to. You can even see some of it there in the cheek. Uh, it's not horrendous, but it's not ideal. I didn't worry about it quite so much because I knew I could get away with it. Uh, also, Blender, in, at least in its current version, this is version 2.83, uh, the tools for smoothing out your retopologized geometry are not that great. You got to do a lot of it manually, which there's always that question. It's kind of a trade-off. Do you spend even more time on this thing for a benefit that will be barely visible, if at all visible, in the project, but it'll make you feel good as a perfectionist inside? Or do you just let some things go? And I definitely let some things go in this. Uh, you may even see toward the end of this video that I realize I've left some internal faces that shouldn't be there in the, the fins that I put along the back of, of the retopologized version, and I kind of just decided, screw it, I'm going to leave them in. Uh, not worth taking the time to, <laughs> to redo it. They're not hurting anything. Here I'm working on the inside of the mouth. That's an area that can be a little bit tricky in this case because this sculpt represents a sculpture or a, a statue. Uh, I don't have to get super anatomically correct uh, it's not a full-on throat that all the way you know goes back into its into its neck. I just allowed it to stop right there, which is probably pretty accurate to what they created for the films. Here I'm working my way along the brow, trying to match up the number of, uh, of vertices between different loops, so that then I can go back in and use Blender's F2 add-on to quickly fill in 
the um, just like you saw right there, fill in the the faces in between them. Very very handy. It's nice when I remember to do that. Sometimes I forget. Here I'm starting to connect up the jawline. Throughout all of this, I've got um, face snapping enabled. Uh, so it knows to, to snap all of this to the underlying surface of the sculpt. And as an added measure, I've got a shrink wrap modifier on this thing, which again, helps it adhere to the surface of the sculpt, uh, even if you, you miss a few spots somehow. That's very helpful. Also got a mirror modifier, so I don't have to do both halves, although I am keeping in mind how the two halves are going to connect up. Uh, I should also mention that the red coloration is purely for my own benefit so that I can make sure that I, I see the difference between the gray of the sculpt and the red of the retopologized version. I've also got the, the, re, the retopologized version set so that it, it shows up always in front. Um, so that way, even if there are some intersections of the surface, I can, I can always see where the, the retopo is. Sometimes that does create issues where you're seeing through, it's kind of hard to explain, but you're seeing through the gray surface to other areas that you've retopologized back behind, which you don't want. So you'll see me use Alt-B in a few cases, especially as I get to the, the hands a little bit later. I'll use Alt-B to uh, reduce my window down to just a, a more manageable area. Here I'm working on those little, I don't even know what to call those, little, little billy goat beard sort of nubs along the bottom of its jaw. Checking my face loops. Yeah, this project has definitely been a, been a good vehicle for me to, to learn some parts of my craft that I haven't focused as much on. Uh, I'm primarily a, a hard surface modeler. I like doing architectural stuff. Uh, and prior to doing this project, this Hogwarts project, I really thought of myself as someone who really just couldn't couldn't sculpt that well. I could I could do some digital painting, I uh, could kind of hack it, um, could do some hard surface modeling, but the, the sculpting I just thought of myself as someone who wasn't really cut out for that. And so it's been really nice to, uh, you know, silver lining to this horrible pandemic situation we're currently going through is that since my uh, employer doesn't have any work for me at the moment, it's given me some time to, to up my skills in, in this arena. Here I'm starting to add uh, some face loops for the ear, working my way around there. Pretty happy with how the ear topology turned out in the end. Work my way around the whole whole thing, and then I started extruding the loops upward, but I left a hole in the front, and then I was able to extrude that inwards, as you'll see in a moment here. Anyway, yeah, I've been, been pleasantly surprised with the fact that, hey, I actually can do some some basic sculpting and even some retopology with a lot of effort. This is this is all moving much more slowly and with much less skill than I'd like. I'm still hoping someday I'll have some sort of crazy breakthrough where I just really get topology and I'm like, aha, it'll be like that that time when I was in ooh, elementary school and suddenly I finally understood what my teachers had been trying to tell me about, about algebra, where you have to do the same thing to both sides of the equation. And it's like, well, how do you know where the different sides are? And finally understood that, oh, it's where the equal sign is. And equal sign doesn't mean you're transforming the thing on the left into the thing on the right. It means that the thing on the left and the thing on the right are interchangeable. Anyway, that's a total tangent. But it's funny how just one little piece of information can give you that whole that whole shift in your mindset where you're like, oh, I get this now. So moral of the story, if any of you have that when it comes to <laughs> topology of, of 3D meshes like this, please, please leave a comment and let me know. I appreciate any help I can get. But ultimately, I am happy with how this one turned out. Again, I got a reduction by <laughs> about 99.9% the number of, of faces on this thing. Um, so the retopology is very, very much worth it, uh, and that enabled me to pop it into the main main model, which is, which is of course the ultimate goal. Uh, there are 
add-ons and standalone programs uh, and whatnot that you can use for automatic retopology. Blender even has some stuff built in natively. I've used that a little bit with with some things, but I found that with this, because I'm really trying to go as low poly as I can while still holding the form, and I'm not going to be doing any additional subdivision on top of it, uh, I found it just seems to produce better results, at least from what I've tried so far, it seems to produce better results just handling it, handling it manually, even if it is difficult for me. <laughs> All right, we're connecting up some of these areas here with the shoulder into the body. You can see, of course, the way this, this snake-like serpentine coil of the body works, it's connected up. There, it, this, is not, this is not one continuous long cylinder that has been then curled back on itself. The, the topology actually meets there in the middle, it's kind of hard to explain, but um, I, I only did that because I knew I wasn't going to be animating this puppy. I was I was just going to be leaving it as a as a standalone sculpt. But if you're going to do this uh, something that were to be animated, then you'd want to sculpt it initially in a very neutral position and not coiled up like this. Here, what I've done is I've I've a moment ago extruded all the way out to the far end of the body, and then I've been using Control r to add edge loops in between, and then get those all aligned with the, the intermediate surface there. Worked pretty well. Only problem is with all this, I semi-forgot that the, the little, little nubs or, or fins or spinal nodes, whatever you want to call them, on, on its back, I had those hidden because those were separate objects, and I don't really know what I was thinking I was going to do at this point, but in the end I had to come back and reintroduce those into this retopologized version, which you'll, you'll see me do in a bit. And in a few spots I ended up having to adjust some of the edge loops using um, double tapping the letter G on the keyboard for edge slide, uh, and introducing some more edge loops were necessary so that I had enough geometry to work with. Worked out pretty well in the end. Here we're getting pretty close to the end of the tail, where then I have to get into the tail itself. If I remember correctly, I think I did cheat a little bit in some parts of the tail, had a few triangles in there. Don't kill me. Um, triangles, as I mentioned, are problematic in cases where you're going to be animating or uh, and or applying uh, non-destructive subdivision to the model afterward because these systems are, are built to work with quads work with with four-sided faces and so triangles don't subdivide very nicely you get weird artifacts and pinching and unless you put them in just the right places and same thing can happen with with poles which are, are uh, where You've got a, a vertex that has more than four, or fewer than three edges moving away from it. Those are spots where you redirect edge flow, which can be really important, but if you do it in the wrong spots, it can introduce some strange deformations and it can really mess with the flow of your edges, which can be a problem when you're animating. It can be a problem when you are UV unwrapping, which even though I, I wasn't going to be doing animation on this, I knew I certainly was going to have to do some UV unwrapping, which, uh, if you're not familiar with that, is, is basically instructing the software how to, I mean, yeah, unwrap this this object, where to slice it open and unwrap it into a, a an imagined flat surface that you can then apply textures to. I knew I, would, I was going to be doing that for my, my normal maps, so I wanted to make sure I had Decent geometry to work with. Here we go, finishing up the tail. If I remember correctly, all I had left to do on the retopo after this is the hands. So you'll see me move back over to those. There, I I really threw in the towel a little bit um, toward the the ends of the claws. I think I 
Like I just put some triangles in there and like, you know what? This will have to do. <laughs> and it worked out okay. One of these days I'll learn how to do it right. Okay, here we go in. You see me use Alt-B to isolate one of those hands. Or pause, whatever you want to call it. I also discovered here, oop, there's a gap in the geometry. Ugh. And that was another thing that I also said. Oh well, because it was on the underside of its middle finger where it grips the edge of the gutter. I knew you're, you're never going to be able to see that. Uh, so I went ahead and retopologized it as if there was no gap there, as if I had done the sculpt correctly. Probably ended up being a little bit of an artifact there in the in the normal map, and I don't care. <laughs> it's okay. This is uh, this hand is in a somewhat less somewhat less neutral position than you would normally model a hand, especially if you were going to be animating it. Um, also, it's only got three fingers. Also, the proportions are a little different from a human hand, though it does have some spookily human-like qualities to it, if you look at the, the reference images, which of course you can see either in the films or you can see them in the, in the part one of this video. So I tried to, I tried to handle the geometry decently well, but yeah, you'll see some triangles down at the bottom. Along this whole process, I knew that to get the right coloration, of this object, I was I was going to need to bake out some sort of height map or displacement map, um, in addition to the normal map. You know, a, a normal map is uh, is uh, it uses RGB color data to represent different angles for light to to bounce off the surface, and so it lets you fake the shading of, in particular, smaller details than are actually present in the 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 object that you've built in the computer, whereas a, a displacement map actually displaces, it actually moves the underlying geometry in a, in a non-destructive way. I knew I wasn't going to be using a displacement map per se on this, I only wanted to normal map it, but I did want to generate a displacement map to use as a basis for some of my, my, my coloration on this, because if you look at these statues in the film, you can see that the raised areas, for example, of the of the centers of the scales, they have a lighter coloration than the areas that are that are recessed, and so I figured, hey, great way to do that would be to to bake out a displacement map. Only problem with that I'd forgotten is to to do that in Blender, you need to have it done using uh, the multi-res uh, modifier, which I did not do for this. Uh, I think that's an unfortunate. Uh, limitation of Blender in its current versions. I, I hope that the, the awesome development team is able to to allow baking of displacement maps as easily as you as you bake normal maps without without multi-res involved. But what you'll see me do uh, is uh, in a little bit here is I just go in and I apply a multi-resolution modifier to this and then I shrink wrap it down to uh, down to the sculpted version. In a moment, I'm going to start UV unwrapping this thing because I am finishing up the last bits of the retopology. Again, I've cheated in a few spots. I don't care. There's spots where I know I can make some compromises. And here we go with the UV unwrapping. I first started to set up the bake uh, for the normal maps, and then I remembered, oh yeah, shoot, I got a UV unwrap first. So UV unwrapping, the basic idea is I'm selecting edges where this is going to be sliced open. So you think about it almost like a, if, if you were going to treat this like a, like a paper, folded paper sculpture or something, um, these are the areas where you'd have to, have to cut it to, to flatten it out, which is what you see me doing on the left. Areas that are blue represent areas that are, uh, being unwrapped with minimal distortion. When you see that green, ooh, that indicates there's some, some distortion there, which is inevitable to some degree, but you want to minimize it, especially in areas that are going to be visible. So I approached this kind of iteratively. I, I kept going back in and adding more cuts. Um, I am unwrapping it repeatedly along the way, not because I thought I was done, but because I just wanted to see how I was doing so far. Again, at this point, I have not added 
the <laughs> the fins along the back. So I'll have to go back in, you'll see, and add those, kind of continuing the retopology efforts, and then go back in and uh, add seams for those and do the final unwrapping. But what you see me doing here is still valuable work because I did use this uh, in the unwrapping. We skipped a little bit of time there where I, I messed some things up and realized that I needed to go back in and add the fins along the back, so that's what I'm doing now. Following a very similar process to what I was doing before, got my shrink wrap modifier plus my snap to face functionality going there. And I've I've joined up, or I don't think I've done it quite yet. Maybe I did. At some point in here, I joined up the. Um, oh yeah, here I go with it. I'm I'm joining up um, duplicates of those fins into the main sculpt, so that that way I can shrink wrap it all onto the same same object. Hopefully, with all of my commentary and with these videos, I'm striking a, a decent balance for those of you that are are actually interested in 3D modeling and maybe have some experience with it, maybe with Blender specifically, um, versus folks who just want to see me make cool Hogwarts stuff, which is also perfectly valid. Um, so if you'd like more detail or less detail, let me know. <laughs> These videos do take a while to put together, add a little bit extra stress to my modeling process, which is why you're not going to see me literally documenting every bit of the process of, of recreating Hogwarts in video form from here on out. Uh, I'll try to reserve it for cool spots, hopefully non-redundant spots, um, because from here on out, if I have to do any more sculpting, which I don't know that I'm really going to have to do much more, but if I do, it's going to be the same process you see here, so not much sense in me showing you that again. I considered speeding up the rest of these fins in the video even more so, um, since I'm really just doing the same thing the rest of the way, but yeah, it only takes a few more minutes and then, then it'll be done. I didn't use any triangles, fortunately, on these little fins, which is, which is cool. It's all quads, which is nice. I did end up in the final, final normal mapped version of this. I ended up with a few shading artifacts around a couple of the fins, just because the the geometry and the, the original sculpt does get pretty complicated, and fortunately those were those artifacts were not really very visible once I applied coloration and moved the camera back a little bit. You can see I've already started doing some of those seams, those darker red edges, where it's going to be split off for UV mapping. Here I'm adding some more of them. I took the exact same approach on each of the fins where I, I split it off into its own little little island. It's completely separate from the rest because there would be way too much distortion if, it, if I tried to flatten that out into part of the same object as, as the back. So yeah, completely separate out each of the fins and then I sliced it along the, the underside out of the seam there so that, uh, so that hopefully the top part, which will be more visible, won't have any, any visible seams. Continuing to add some edge loops in a few spots where the sculpt didn't have quite enough for me to introduce the fins. I could have, I could have kept the fins as separate objects. Um, it would have been quicker and easier to do it that way, especially since they're all um, duplicated, linked versions of the same mesh. Um, the reason I didn't do that was because I knew that this was going to be then ported over to my main model of Hogwarts and then duplicated many times, and I knew it was going to give me fewer headaches if I had this all just as one object, full stop, one material applied to it, one normal map, just get it done. So that's, that's the approach that I took here. It took a little bit longer, but I am glad that I I took that approach. So then when I have to have to duplicate these dragons across the different parts of the greenhouse and then to different greenhouses, it's just one object to deal with. All right, we're getting close here to the end of the fins. 
not too many more to go. After which I do the, the final UV unwrapping and you'll see me do a do a, a basic automatic unwrapping and then you'll see me rotate and rescale things to try to optimize where I get the most detail. The, the normal map and displacement map that I, I bake are only at 1K resolution, which is pretty small. Again, I only did that because this is a big project overall and I didn't want to eat up unnecessary amounts of memory. Oh, here I'm applying that multi-res modifier and shrink wrapping it. I ended up with a little bit of distortion here. It probably would have been better if I had just gone in and used multi-res from the beginning. Live and learn. Uh, I didn't really realize in the beginning I needed to, I, I was going to need a displacement map or how difficult that would be. All right, here I'm baking the displacement map. Or I'm sorry, no, I'm not doing that yet. I need to finish unwrapping it. So here I've unwrapped and now I'm manually adjusting the sizes and positions and rotations of everything to optimize the amount of space I've got available. I knew there were certain areas like the back that I wanted a lot of detail for all those scales, whereas like the inside of the mouth, I don't need much detail there. Um, so trying to approach it in a relatively intelligent way. Now I go in to bake out my displacement map and it doesn't work right. It comes out all gray. So I paused and I googled and I realized, oh, simple problem. I just needed to turn down the resolution. Um, there it is. Turn down the resolution of the multi-res modifier and great, there you go. Now we've got our displacement map. Again, I didn't want to apply this as a displacement map. It was only being baked as a displacement map, but then I was going to apply it as part of the coloration. And that's what you see me doing here. Used a color ramp node to adjust the coloration, give the, the deeper parts kind of a blue color. And I adjusted the material settings a bit to give it a quasi-metallic finish. Then I used a, a noise no, a texture node to give a little bit more variation on top of the basic displacement, and kind of mess it up just a little bit. Then I baked the normal map, you can see there. Apply that to that same texture, that same material rather. Adjust the, uh, the strength of it. And then view it in conjunction with the coloration that I created with the displacement map. And that looks pretty good. Now we'll pop it over to the main Hogwarts model. This is our, our final steps. We're coming into the home stretch here. I built it to the correct scale, so I didn't have to worry about rescaling it, just had to get it in the right position. Uh, this was done as, uh, as a linked object, so I can't edit it at all in, in, in this file. I have to go back and edit it in the, uh, the, the original file, but that's really handy because it keeps this file lighter weight and, and it performs a little better. Here I used an array modifier to space these out every 20 feet. I knew they needed to be. This is being done with a, a proxy of the linked object so that I can move things around. Then we duplicate that proxy, also linked around to the other side, mirror it, and now we've got all our dragons in place. Set up the camera to create uh, a render of it that we can use to showcase the position, check to make sure it's looking right, and then render it, and boom, there it is. It worked. And that's our, our final positioning of those dragon sculpts. They are now complete and they're ready for me to go in and duplicate the greenhouses with the dragons and create all the different variations on the greenhouse designs and add them to the, the domed conservatory out front and really just make this area come to life. So if you'd like to see that process happen, please be sure to check out the blog, hogwarts4d.home.blog. Uh, and we'll be posting lots more updates there. Make sure to subscribe here. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see you next time for some more progress on building this Hogwarts model. Take care of yourself. Take care of your loved ones. See you real soon.